So I have this thing called the violence scale, which is totally arbitrary, I made it up, but you know, the violence scale is a one through 10 scale. Every number in between zero and 10 is risk. I come in at a zero, as soon as I know it's gonna be violent and that switch is flipped, I go to 10. Because if they go to a higher number before I do, I'm dead. Thank you, brother. Thank you for, 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 for being oh, here. Oh, man, thanks for having me. Dude, come on, man. I, I, uh, I, I really want to bring folks on that, that I just feel um, have really walked the walk, don't just talk about it, and um, are humble and kind and honest and uh, courageous. And um, you're sort of, um, I can't really think of somebody better uh, than you. You grew up in Bakersfield. <laughs> uh, you went into the military. I want to talk to you about Bakersfield. <laughs> went to the military, uh, Sp Special Forces, Delta and Ranger. Um, you got wounded uh, uh, overseas. You know, you were you were both the subject and the star of uh, an incredible documentary made by uh, a very dear friend of both of ours. You know, the, the person that like, kind of attaches you and I and Rick Waugh. Yeah. There are like no words for how much that guy means to me and like the chance he took on me and um, how he's made me kind of believe in myself. And one thing I can tell you about Rick is like anybody in Rick's orbit is just solid as fuck. Yeah. And, and yeah, just true. like, wh who's Rick Waugh and like who, who does Rick, like what does he mean to you? For lack of a better term, he's just great at everything he does. And and I, actually the first thing I'm gonna actually say is it's not related to the industry or, or, or work, but He's the best father I've ever seen, mm -hmm. you know. How so? Um, you know, he doesn't, he, he strikes the perfect balance. He's got two twin, twin boys, but he strikes the perfect balance between, in, in, in of course, my humble opinion, uh, between treating them as kids and adults. You know, like he gives them the, the kid experience and leeway, yet at the same time, he doesn't, he doesn't bullshit him. He doesn't lie to him. He, does, you know what I mean. Yep. He, he very much treats them um, as many adults, but but also also kids. And and there's a good balance between that. And 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 again, if there's any testament to to how good of a, a father he is, uh, you know, meet the kids. Right. You know, they're they're amazing. They are. Um. And, and oh yeah, you obviously have. And and um. And then of course, uh, like everything else he does, you know, as a filmmaker, as a writer, as a director, as you know, everything he does. He's just a machine. There's nothing on a film set that he doesn't know. Rick is such a soldier of authenticity. You yes. know, like he made a movie, Felon, yep. was sort of the first, first yep. I mean, it was the first movie he made about, you know, Corcoran prison riots and the gladiator games. And he like literally went and like basically became a pro, like a parole officer yeah. and basically Two became years. a pro. But yeah, and like did that time. And, you know, when, you know, he did Snitch, he did Shot Caller. Those are the movies that I did with him and that we did with him. But, you know, he, you know, he gains access into a world. He craves authenticity. He provides the infrastructure and, 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 and opens the door into the real world in a way that no, no one else that I've ever worked with, you, you, you know, does. And, um, you know, that's kind of where you came in, right? Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he kind of yeah. came to you. I mean, when did he first come to you? Uh, we met through a mutual friend and he was writing a movie, a military movie. Uh, we had lunch at the Grove and it was like 2009, something mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, just right away, you know, we started talking and we worked on that script for a couple months and then started work on another one. Uh, neither got made, but, after working on that script and just talking about what I knew, um, or from my experience, he uh, invited me to lunch one day, which A, was weird, and uh, <laughs> B, he's like, uh, sat me down, he's like, hey, uh, so I got some time before, I forget what he had to do, but he's like, you know, I've always wanted to do a documentary, and I'm, you know, sitting there eating, I don't know, cool. Um, and he's like, and you know, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, I, I don't really think people like know that message. Um, like, would you want to, you want to do one? And me being me, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Sounds good. You know, no idea. I was getting into this five year, very personal process. Uh, and you know, so we, we made that over five years and, uh, and again, his, it, it is, it, it is what it is because of his, um, 
just intuition on 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 the human experience and and uh, he's able to take any and all authenticity that's maybe that authenticity is specific for prison or specific for the military or whatever but he has a way of translating that specific authenticity into a universal human authenticity and totally. experience and, and that i mean that documentary can you can you just tell us a little bit about the documentary and, and yeah yeah so it's called uh, that which i love destroys me which um is really a, a bastardized uh, latin quote that kind of reversed because uh, it made more sense to me but um it, it portrays to a degree a solution um or you know like us overcoming these obstacles and what's interesting for me is what I realized in hindsight was the documentary was really the beginning mm. of my actual real journey. That was the entire documentary was really just me figuring out the problem. And it was at the end of the documentary when that was over with that I really uh, started working on the solution. Whereas if you watch the documentary, you'd think that it's you know totally yeah. encapsulated. So the most progress you will have as a person and probably in your life is A, doing the things you don't want to do and be addressing the parts of your personality that you bury and hide. We lie, we lie to no one more than we lie to ourselves. You said something earlier about how like we are, we are sort of in, in evolutionary biology, I think you're saying how like we are, we're literally like designed to only address and, and worry about and take care of what's going on right in front of us right now. But right now we're inundated with so much more like extraneous fucking information. How do you whittle that down? Uh, you know, for me, again, I mean, the, the I guess for lack of a better term, the theory or the, the science is uh, evolutionary psychology. And it, it basically says that, um, you know, within evolution that we are obviously evolution takes time so we're not designed for right now we haven't evolved to right now we were evolved to thousands of years ago as hunter uh, gatherer societies and when you start studying how hunter gatherer societies worked and then you start and then you apply a lot of problems of today and then apply it to that you go i mean there's not a smoking gun but it's pretty obvious that the truth is is pretty apparent um and, and on that note with, you know, if you, if you look at a hunter gatherer society, it was generally, and some scientists is going to be like, he's full of shit, but you know, it's like 50 to a hundred people was, you know, like a, a hunter gatherer tribe or whatever. And, you know, with, without, uh, obviously the internet radio communication, if, if somebody from that tribe told you something, it was important to your, probably your daily survival in that moment. Mm. Hey, there's a, a, you know, a buffalo coming in to freaking, you know, and ravaging the camp, whatever. I don't know, making stuff up, right, right. but, but you know what I mean? Like that, that was relevant. Anything you heard, anything was relevant because it was relevant to that group. That group is your survival. And the only thing that you could possibly hear by definition of the lack of technology at the time was something relevant to that 50 to a hundred sure. people. Nowadays, um, we're constantly inundated with information from, you know, not, I mean, everyone's like, ah, 24 hour news cycles. It's like, no, 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 forget 24 hour news cycles. Try, you know, how many texts a day do you get? Right, right. You know, how many emails a day do you get? We are overloaded with information. All of those information streams for the most part are designed to make it as easy as humanly possible to absorb them. Yes. And humans by nature take the easy path, right? So to actually turn those things off and point yourself in a different direction takes an amazing amount of mental strength now and stamina. Totally. And we don't ever talk about that. Yeah. Like we're asking a lot of people to now look in the face of that information stream and choose a different behavior. It's, it's unbelievably hard to do. It, it is because, because of that wiring of your brain going, but what if one piece is important? Right. What if I do need to know one piece, you know? And, and, um, everyone's well I'd say most people have done it now where you you know you know and I'm gonna go away for the weekend and I'm not gonna have my phone on and the proofs in the pudding or at least I'll turn it off for five minutes yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you know what I'm saying like how do you feel if you had your if if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you had no reception for a whole day other than the anxiety of oh, I gotta get a hold of this person like how do you feel it's fucking great it's great it's yeah. relaxing yeah it's because that's what you're designed for yeah you're designed for um, and I think it's actually Tim Ferriss's term, the low information diet. Um, now that I'm 
remembering, but um, it's, uh, I've done it now for, uh, I don't know, six months. Like I don't have, I mean, granted, there's been news things where, <laughs> you know, like, it's been like four days. Oh, you know Trump really. lost, right? Like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's certain things where people are like, you don't know about this? And I'm like, no. And, and they're like, oh, my God. And, yeah, you feel like, oh, maybe I'm behind, but are you? Did, did, yeah. do I really need to know that? Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't. And, and not to say, and I'm going to put something out there that's it's going to be controversial, uh -oh. but we just need to care less. I think that's the problem. Everyone's pushing, caring more, 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 more. You mean more. like politically and like in the tribalism, I, like I in just, a, like I, I mean, if this, it's a collective push to care more about everything and everyone, and the reality is the opposite. The reason that's going to make you miserable, by definition, this is, this is a fact. Is I can care about you. I can I can care about you to level a hundred, but I can't control or change you. Right. So all the things that you care about that you can't control, they're just gonna make you miserable yeah. because you care about them, but you can't control them. The only thing that you can control is you. If we all cared about ourselves and truly cared about ourselves and controlled ourselves, we'd be happier because we can actually actuate change. And then we wouldn't need to care and push others to do other things because everyone would be, and, and again, I'm. You know, this is a, a, a obviously a, a utopian idea that's not possible, but I'm saying theoretically, um, the easiest way to be miserable is to try and control everything around Fucking you. A. It'll it'll fundamentally fail. Fucking A. Always does. And 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 that's another thing I had to accept is every aspect of myself, uh, even when I switched and was like, okay, I can only control me. Okay, I'll, I'll control me. And I started working on control me and then I also learned, hey, there's some things you can't control about yourself. It seems like so much of your life, like you ha you just are like this self-motivated, self-driving, like I don't quit, like fucking bring on the pain, whatever. Like when did you know you want to be in the military? Like how did that come about? Well, it, it's it's funny you say it because I, I don't feel like I ever had a decision. It was something that I wanted to do for as long as I could remember. I mean, I was probably, I mean, I could show you pictures of me when I was, you know, five in full camo, like, I mean, that was, that was always who I was. It was, uh, it was something I had to do from as early as I can remember. And Is it in the family? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, other than grandfather in World War II, like everyone's, sure. but, um, no, my dad wasn't in the military. It just, it was something I just, I just had this innate, like, I have to do this. I had a ranger and a special forces poster on my wall, uh, as a kid and, and, um, you know, like, I mean, I probably played guns, you know, you know, played war uh, shit every day, literally every day. And, and um, it was just so a part of who I was when when I got to that point, you know, um, it, it really wasn't it, it wasn't really a choice. It was just something I felt I had to do. When you got old enough to remember it. When it became conscious, so like post childhood mm -hmm. before signing up, do you remember thinking about the structure of military, the camaraderie and team of military, the patriot, like what was it at that point? Do you have some conscious memory then of what the driver was that excited you to, to join? Yeah, uh, yeah. And again, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, yeah. even though it'll raise some eyebrows. Um, I want to kill bad guys. Straight up. You know, and, and, and again, now uh, the term bad guy you know, is, is yeah. <laughs> don't even get me started on that. But, you know, I, I looked at it as a kid, you know, I was fascinated with, uh, with the middle ages and knights and samurai, you know, um, the code of honor and, and, and helping those who couldn't help themselves. And that's, to me, special operations was the current equivalent of that. What was your sort of experiences, if any, with violence, with real violence before joining the military? Um, you know, other than I, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty good as a kid. Um, I, I could talk my way out of just about anything. I mean, I, I got in fights, but, um, but generally I could talk my way out of a fight. Um, 
and unless, you know, uh, there was sometimes I didn't want to talk my way out of it. But, you know, that was also 80s, you know, time where, you know, kids could punch each other in the face and it wasn't a big Wouldn't deal. Wouldn't a big deal, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, I never saw, um, I'll, I'll say the word true violence, I would say, uh, as a child. I never saw, like, true violence. Um, it, it wasn't until I was in that I saw like what I would call real violence. Um, but you know, I, but I'll say this and again, sounds weird, but, but I wanted to see it. Like I, I just had this, I wanted to see every facet of, of the, the human animal animal. Like I, I wanted to see, mm -hmm. I wanted to see the extremes, you know? I want to see how far this can go. I want to see. I want to see. Uh, I want to see the animal unleashed. Yep. You know. You knew. You knew it was always rangers. Uh, well, originally I wanted. You know. I, I mean, I was a huge. And and I'll just say this now because it it'll probably come up later. But the two things there was two things I wanted to do as a kid. One, obviously, in military, as I've been saying. The other was I was fascinated by film. I probably watched Star Wars two hundred times as a kid. I broke. Wow. The, I broke the VHS tape like wow. no shit. Um, and uh, so I watched Rambo probably over 100 times. Yeah. So I wanted to be a Green Beret. Yeah. Um, when I joined, uh, you couldn't get a Green Beret contract. That didn't start until actually after 9-11. So I was like, well, what's the, you know, what can you guarantee me an opportunity for? Uh, and they said Ranger. So uh, that's, that's how I, I went to. And obviously I knew about Rangers and I had studied all the, all the special operations forces. Um, People are like, why didn't you become a SEAL? And I'm like, uh, mainly because I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> kind of remove that one from the... And people are like, no, everyone can swim. No, I, but I seriously don't float. And can yeah. you just explain <laughs> to, to people that... Can you just explain, you know, Rangers versus Delta and, like, how you did... But, like, how, what, what that is and what that process was like? Yeah, ra Rangers are, you know, it's a special operations unit, um, but it's, for, for lack of a better term... Uh, a starter, you know, you can come in off the street, you know, so you got people that are very senior that have been there 10 years, you know, and uh, you've done all kinds of things. And then you got, you know, 18, 19 year olds straight off the street um, that that then have to get indoctrinated in, into that program. And and really, when I went through the, the, the selection process was called RIP, literally was Ranger Indoctrination Program which was they just smoked the shit out of you and, and just crushed you every day. And the people that quit didn't make it. And the people that didn't quit made it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. What's it, the percentage but, there? You know, I, I, I don't know yeah. really. It's, I mean, you know, probably sixties, seventies, right. whatever, but, um, mostly physical or mental. Um, well, both, uh, most people can handle, the body is always stronger than the mind. Always, 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 always. So uh, it's really a process of essentially making something physical also mental. You know, once, you're, once your mind is, is at that level of uh, zero fucks, like it, it's, it's hard to destroy a person who really just yeah. is at that point where, you know, they're, they're, they're zen and, you know, they're just, I, I don't care what you do to me. Um, because it'll end, you know, and anyways, and, and so, uh, you go through that process and, and, and you get there and, and then you go through, you know, a train up process. And what I loved about Ranger Battalion, uh, is that it is in a, it's a special operations unit, but it's also an elite infantry unit. Um, so for me, you learn infantry tactics and, uh, I'll, I'll take a Pepsi challenge to anyone that disputes this, but despite what anyone says, all special operations, all combat, CQB, like the coolest CQB ever, is just infantry combat in a confined space. The, the, the fundamental concepts of, of combat haven't changed forever, you know, as long as it's humans doing it. Whether you're holding an ax, a spear, a sword, or a gun, or a bow and arrow, it's, it's a game of angles and, you know, train, all these different things. So I love that I learned the basis, the, the, the beginnings of, of basic infantry skills and elite infantry skills. Um, and then later when I went to the, the tier one counterterrorism unit, 
I had a, a great understanding of those basics and then, you know, obviously they take it to another level, but um, anything advanced is just a master, a master of the basics. And I would argue, you know where to cheat the basics and like where to just, yeah, step one, two, three, I'll just go from one to three. And that timeline, like when you, when you did that and you made that switch, had you already, had you already been in combat? Yeah, I'd been to Afghanistan. So my, my first uh, year as a ranger, I was, my first job was an assistant machine gunner, which is like the worst job ever. You don't even have a gun. <laughs> yeah. Like I had a pistol and a fucking bag full of ammo and barrels. It was yeah. horrible. And a tripod yeah. weighed like 70 something pounds. So it was the worst job ever. But mm, actually I say it was the worst job ever, but it actually really taught me something, which is taught me to just suck it up and carry weight and just carrying weight over long distances up hills again that that's a perfect example of people would always say you know rucking heavy weight is is physical and i'm like no it's mental because your body wants to quit every second because you got 100 pounds in your back it feels like it's trying to crush you like a foot in an aluminum can um but your body can go for 100 miles the mind wants to quit within the first 10 steps. Right. Um, so it taught me that. And then I became a sniper and, and I did that until I left. How did 9-11 sort of like play into all of that for you at, the, at that time? Um, actually, that's a, that's a great question because I was, uh, and this kind of goes to what you and I were talking about earlier off camera, of, you know, I, I had done, I forget how long I had been in by the time 9-11 happened, but um, I was right in my like reenlistment window. And before 9-11, I was like, I'm getting out. Like, you know, I joined to fi I joined to go to war. Like, I, I mean, not that there was a war going on when I joined, but, you know, I was optimistic. Um, but, uh, and, and I just was going to get out. And I don't, I don't even remember what my plan was, but, but I was going to get out. Oh, actually, I actually was going to come to Hollywood. So then 9-11 happened. And uh, there was a lot unknown at that time. Uh, third Ranger Battalion went before we did. So, you know, we didn't know. We thought the war was going to be over. So I said, look, if we get orders to deploy to Afghanistan, I will literally re-enlist re that day. Until then, I'm not re-enlisting because I'm not going to re-enlist and then the war is over. And, you know, obviously little little did we know at that time <laughs> right, how right, long right, it was going right, to last. Right. But, um, you know, when, when you had, uh, you know, I, I mean, the control over most of the country happened, happened relatively quickly. So, we, you know, we thought it'd be over with. So... Um, we got orders to Afghanistan and, and I re-enlisted for six years, uh, with the intent of, of going to the, the, the other unit or trying to go to the other unit. Um, my first deployment to Afghanistan was, uh, uh, after, um, Operation Anaconda. It was actually also, we switched out the people that were at Roberts Ridge, which is a, a horrible, uh, kind of like a Black Hawk Down scenario except it was a, a Chinook, but um, it was when they had pushed, Anaconda pushed all of, all of the, uh, the Taliban to, um, to the Pakistani border area. So my deployment, my first deployment was basically building the outstations along uh, the Pakistani border, which is now, you know, Korgal Valley, all, all those places that, you know, now we know the names of, that, that was when we first started building wow. those outstations. Wow. So it was, uh, it, it, it was, it was in, it was very interesting because it was, because war was new. It was what, like Vietnam. It was crazy. What was your day to day like there? I mean, can you, can you take us uh, through it a little bit? Uh, well, I, one day I just happened to remember in, in, uh, so I was literally sleeping in a goat pen. Um, but one day we, we had to dig mortar pits. So, and, and again, you know, like now I look back and I'm like, oh, we should have known, but we had to dig mortar pits, and so we had like I don't know six blocks of six blocks of C4. You know, I mean, you're, you're, we're in combat. Like, I don't know, go grab the C4. Cool. You know, no one. It's not like anyone's tracking it on a piece of paper, right? right. So we go grab six blocks of C4. We we put sandbags on it. We tamp it, and we because we have to blow this mortar pit. And the mortar pits, I forget how deep, but it's got to be like four feet deep. I forget, and pretty big. We blow this up. We walk over there. And I'm not joking, it looked like a little kid had taken a scooper and scooped like three scoops out of the ground. And I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. Like that's how the train is, is fierce there. Wow. Um, but I'll never forget just looking at it and going, 
that was C4, right? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, we eventually figured it out. But um, it was it was just at that time, combat was so new that everyone was just figuring out what it was, uh, for lack of a better term. I mean, we, we were, at that time, you know, as a sniper, I was a sniper team leader, we would go on four-man, uh, we'd go out for four days and stay out in the mountains for four days, just, you know, or like a, like, um, uh, what's it called? A move, uh, lone survivor of that type, you know, we'd go and, you know, report on movement and all these different things. And it was just four of us wow. out there. And looking back now, knowing obviously a lot more about combat and war, it's like, man, we were hanging it out there. It was four dudes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you had a force of, you know, whatever, it's not a lot you could do. But, right. uh, at that time, it was just a now there's no way they would hell i was in e i was like 23 years old or something like that and i was in charge like there's no way they would let some dudes out of the wire you know yeah go for four days like tell us what happens it just uh at that time you know it was just it was just new so fast forward a little bit you know you take those feelings you had when the war started and being out there with those four guys and, and go through the sort of time warp a year, two years forward in your time. How did your mindset change and the way you felt about those same things evolve in the time that you were there? Well, so part of the, I'm gonna use the word problem, um, was like, I didn't really, like I had a great time in Afghanistan. Like I had a fucking good time, it was, it was fun. Cause it was what I wanted to do. It was, I wanted to go to combat. like. I wanted to fucking be buried in mud with a fucking knife, like a, you know, Rambo, man. Right. And um, so I, I actually really enjoyed it. And um, and then even when, you know, so I get back from Afghanistan and I basically, I worked with the unit that I went to. I got to work with them in Afghanistan because they didn't have a sniper team. So we got attached to them. And, uh, and I was like, okay, like this is, this is the movie cool shit. Like, mm -hmm. this is what I want to be doing. What were they doing? It, it was more that, you know, they, they were developing their own, I'll say it this way, they were able to develop their own intel and develop their own targets. And you know what I mean? Like, they were able to create their own missions. Yep didn't come from somebody else going, hey, there's guys over. They were going, hey, let's see what's actually there. Mm, this is there. Okay, hey, let's go hit it. You know, they were. So like what we were talking about before, free thinkers, ex got people who are intuitive, uh, could take initiative. Exactly. They were developing their own intel. They were they were uh, seeing everything. They, they were willing to go out there, um, uh, you know, uh, firsthand and see what the intel actually was, not what other people said it was. Right. And and, um, and I just, like, again, all all combat has to be driven by off of, off of some kind of intel, or it's just, you know, it's, that's how you get, that's how you get killed. Um, and so I was like, this is, this is really, th their autonomy was just really, uh, like you said, their ability to free think and not be controlled by the big army system. I, I was like, that's cool. That, that's that's what I want to do, and so when I got back from that trip, I I uh, put in a packet and I went through that whole process, which took uh, about a year, um, and then I got assigned uh, to the unit uh, there, um, and then I was there for I don't, I don't know how long, maybe six months before we deployed to Iraq. Um, you know, and, and I remember, this is a funny thing, I remember being in training and 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 everyone's like, ah, Iraq, and I'm like, we're not going to Iraq, that ain't gonna happen. Like Afghanistan, there's no way. Like I firmly was like, Iraq's not gonna happen. And then when we invaded Iraq, I was like, oh shit, well, wrong about that, you know? And then, <laughs> you know, six months later or whatever, I'm I'm going to, uh, you know, flying to, to Iraq to, uh, um, my the first well got to Baghdad and then we were in Fallujah but um and then Fallujah was Fallujah in 2004 I mean it was it was fucking World War II like I I 
I can't describe it other than it, it was a war war. You know, when you're in Afghanistan, you know, yeah, I've seen Spectre, you know, hammering stuff and I'd seen, you know, I'd seen things, but like a freaking tank coming in and shooting in a city yeah. A building, yeah. like we were calling cast on buildings in the city. I mean. Street to street. Yeah, that that was war to me. You know, I, I was like, holy shit. Like this is on, a, you know, Cobra gunships coming in and just dumping stuff. I mean, that was like, wow. Um, and it really, again, it was, and it sounds, it is what it is. I, that's what I wanted. Like, you know, I watched Rambo and I wanted PTSD. Right. I don't know what kind of fucked up kid that makes me, but I I wanted to be fucked up like Rambo. I right. wanted to go to the town, grab the M60 and get in a fight with the fucking sheriff. That, right. That's right. what I wanted. Right, right. You know? When you got wounded, did it change any of that mentality that you had? Or did you want to get back to the fight? Did you miss the fight? How did you feel differently after you got I, wounded? didn't change until probably the last three years. I, I can honestly say if there's anything that's surprised me, it's that, you know, 10 years after being out, you're like, well, surely I'm, surely it is what it is at this point. I'm not gonna change my mentality. And just in the last two to three years, I see things absolutely completely different, a absolutely completely different and it's, and, and now I see where like a lot of older veterans get, I, I get it. And it, and it's kind of, it's not kind of, it's heartbreaking. It, it's heartbreaking because it doesn't matter what you say, like you can't explain it, but one day they'll get there on their own and then they too will want to explain it to the younger version of themselves but they can't and it's just it's just it's just like watching all these people that are that you just you you know what's going to happen you know their future but you can't what but, flipped that switch for you two or three years man ago? i don't know I, I i i've thought about that i i i've tried to i don't know um it's awareness of just the overall, and I don't mean this in any, you know, uh, conspiratorial sense, but like the overall system, just the way that human beings have always been over time. It's just the way we are. It's a cycle. And and what's interesting about that cycle is you know, the warrior cycle. It's, it's not new, you know, you can, it's been this way for thousands of years. And um, one thing that I think, I don't know if I said this in the documentary, but Again, I'll still use the, the, the word or the term PTSD, even though I think it's more complicated than that. But, you know, back, uh, uh, oh, let, we'll say Braveheart, great movie, Braveheart times, okay? Braveheart times, you know, we're running at each other and hitting each other with axes, you know, and we're this close together. That, that, that's pretty hardcore combat, right? Well, yeah, but also, uh, freaking bomb dropping and blowing up all of us that we didn't even know the fucking airplane was up there. Right. And then now we're in pieces. Is that any more or less ruthless? It's about the same. Yeah. The difference is now you know, we live a pretty good life, not in war, but back in Braveheart times, even if you weren't in combat, life was fucking hard. Right. Every time you wanted to eat, you were doing that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, kids died, you know, in childbirth, very common. Your brother dies from dysentery, literally shits to death. Right. Common, common. Right. So back then, life was this hard, combat was this hard. Now, combat's still the same, but life is so much easier. And that difference that chasm that, that just chasm. must be fucking and and that must have been so insane to come back to and and it, and, and see it, it, it's it's you, it's like you're jumping between two realities right and and that difference to me is ptsd because you've seen this other reality that you know exists and then you come back to a place that no one else has seen it it's like an imaginary world you're like no no, no i'm i'm telling you like some people are capable of this and people are like oh no people aren't capable of 
But again, they wouldn't know in, until they've seen it. And another thing that you realize in combat is, I don't, I don't care who you are. Everyone has murder in them. Everyone, absolutely everyone. And people are like, well, well, well. The reason we do, and again, there's exceptions to every rule, don't get me wrong, but of course we do. We're designed that way. Of course. We're designed, it's literally a survival mechanism. If, you know, 200 years ago, it's, you know, me and you hand to hand, like, yeah. Can you uh, give me an example of something that shocked the shit out of you, or that, like, like, like uh, of that example of somebody that you, you, you wouldn't think they had it in them, or? You know, I saw people's level of ruthlessness on, on, you know, some of those people that are just such, you know, the most innocent, nice guy. And then you just see them being absolutely ruthlessly violent. And it, it, it's surprising, you know, and, and, but what's worse is, again, I'm not that way by nature. And I remember in the beginning, I was like, well, that's, that's fucking unnecessary. I, well, I don't really, I don't really agree with that. I, I think you should do the minimum amount to, to, to get things done, the minimum amount of violence to get things done. And that's how I felt for the first couple of years. Then I realized, and, and these people, by the way, that I'm talking about were at that time, had done more trips, were more experienced than me. And then I realized over time, no, there's, when it comes to, um, so I have this thing called the violence scale, which is totally arbitrary, I made it up, but, you know, the violence scale is a one through 10 scale. And, you know, for me back then, it was like, you know, start with one. And if one doesn't work, you go to two. And if two doesn't work, you go to three, you know, and then once it works, then you stop. And what I eventually learned is, is that every number in between zero and 10 is risk. Risk that you're taking on to go through those numbers. For me to truly have no risk, I come in at a zero, as soon as I know it's gonna be violent and that switch is flipped, I go to 10. Because if the reason is, if they go to a higher number before I do, I'm dead. They win, I lose. So you, you learn over time, you have to be absolutely, when it comes to violence, when it comes to that game, Everything in between, you know, one and nine is, is just you opening yourself up to lose. And, 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 and it goes like fighting, and I'm not talking about boxing, like real fighting. I always say, and look, I'm not a martial artist, but I always say first rule of fighting, same thing as the first rule of gunfighting, same thing as the first rule of war, cheat. There's no honor in death. You know, the freaking first, it, it, there's no rules. No one, it's war. Fuck you. Like, that's the reality of it. Um, and it, and it's a horrible reality. And the problem is, is that we're at a point where we can't do war that way for many reasons. So there's this ambiguity in this. It's just, we're doing war with rules, which doesn't make any sense. It would blow people's minds how much risk we take as as soldiers or you know airmen, you know navy, whatever, um, marines to you know when when we know we shouldn't uh, because of politics essentially. Puts a lot of pressure on very young people though to be able to accurately gauge when a one is even going to become a two, right? And, and talk about that challenge a little bit, because I imagine as you got more experienced, that was probably an easier call to make. But for an 18 year old out there for the first time, if you're looking at it as a one or a 10, you actually gotta be really good at figuring out when it's a two. And my guess is when you're not that experienced, that, that's a pretty damn hard call to make. It, it, it is, and people can't grasp a, how much training it takes to go into a room and there's a good guy and a bad guy Assess, and only shoot yeah. the bad guy. I mean, it's it's not only an unbelievable amount of training, it's an unbelievable amount of time. And on top of all that, you learn through the training process, it's also something in your head. Some people can do it, some people can't. And you don't really know till you're there, right? No, I mean, you, you can train your ass and talk about that. I mean, so you, you know, you went through 
some of the most extensive training possible. How different, how prepared were you? How different is it when you actually get in into the real thing? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like you're saying, which is, you know, you don't really, the selection process that we had, and, and I'll not go into it, but I'll say this, because it's unofficial, this is what I think it is, is, because what it is, what you're doing, you're like, what the fuck does this have to do with fighting wars? You know, like, this doesn't make any sense, you know? And now I look back and I go, God, it makes, it's so smart. Oh, really? Yeah. That's it, interesting. And again, not official, this is what yeah. I think it is. What I think it is, is it's designed to find people that can get instructions once and figure it out. If they make a mistake, they self-correct. They don't go down the rabbit hole of, oh, well, they just this. fucking, they just self-correct. Cause it's all by yourself. You're alone almost the whole time. Um, and the other thing is they learn very quickly and they learn very quickly from their mistakes. That's what I think it's designed for. Because once you have that, you can teach them anything. I want to ask you something else about, I mean, I guess so much shit I want to ask you, man, but I, I, I want to ask you so, uh, something else about that chasm. Yeah. When you think about these things, like what you're talking about, uh, about the, the, the parallel between brave hard times and war and life and like how now it's like everything in our life, literally everything is so like, easy. One thing they talk about is just transportation, just like literally in World War II would have taken few weeks of just yeah. still being around yeah. soldiers. But like, you know, now it's like literally the next day you're home. Yeah. And, and I'm just wondering in your, your situation, as well because your time there just kind of came to an end, correct? Because you were wounded. Yeah, and, and, I was and straight, you know, litter to Germany within a day and then back home took like a week, but. You know, I know Kevin Vance, another guy that we both love and have, have ultimate yeah. respect for, you know, he talked about, you know, why ult one of the reasons he ultimately, you know, got out was he was like, look, man, I would come home and I'd have to turn the monster off. Yeah, and then yeah, I'd yeah. go and I'd have to turn the monster back on. And 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 it was just getting harder and harder to make that. But for you and your psychology, you you still had years, you still were there with these guys doing this thing for years. So so I imagine your monster, whatever it was for you, was that that's that's where you were at. So do you do you feel like that? As far as how, whatever you want to call it, the PTSD or like the, the, the psychological distress and, 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 and torture that you went through, was that part of it? Do you think that it was like the proximity was taken, like the rug was pulled out from under you in a way? Or do you think you were going to go through that no matter what? I think I, I was lucky in the sense that my, I had always, um, I had always compartmentalized my life. Um, just for reasons of how I grew up, you know. Um, so I had always compartmentalized things. So it didn't really, it didn't really affect me as much as I saw it affect others. In ways did that serve you? I, you know, I, I also think, again, I'm, I'm being very forthcoming. I also think I just have a, a little sociopathic, um, you know, I've watched like every murder documentary there is, and I'm yeah. fascinated by watching uh, uh, psychopaths. And, you know, just psychopathy is is just fascinating to me. Um, and I obviously very much have a conscience. And uh, funny story, I was talking to my therapist years ago, and I was I was like, I'm worried, I'm, I might be a sociopath, like because I have these sociopath tendencies. And she goes, Tyler. If you're worried that you're a sociopath, you're not. <laughs> you're definitely not a sociopath. And I was like, oh, I can't, 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 can't argue with that one. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, how did I miss that one? But, um, but I definitely have this little thing where, um, and, and I'll give you a story. And there's nothing. I'm going to tell you the story, and it's going to sound crazy, but it's not crazy, and that's why I'm telling it. Um, we did this raid on this house, and anyways, fucking, I don't know, 13 guys were shot. I, I can't remember. And um, and I had a, a digital camera, and I had to go take pictures of the uh, of all of them, all, all the guys, and ran it through the Intel system, blah, blah, blah. And um, I went to this one guy. He was in the kitchen, and uh, he was shot, I don't know how many times, but at least eight. 
not that I'm fucking counting holes, but um, but he wasn't dead. And his head was, you know, down, and I got down there to take the picture, and when I got down there, I realized he wasn't dead, and I just kind of watched him, and then I was like, oh, shit, you know, I, I think he's going to die. I think he's going to die right now. And I just sat there, and I just I just watched him, and I, I literally did it. It was, it was... It was an experiment, like a human experiment. It had nothing to do with the military. Sure. I was just like, I, I want to see what I, like, does it do anything? And um, no, I didn't, just nothing. It, 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 it didn't mean anything to me. And what I realized is that in my head, again, the little sociopathic quality is, mm -hmm. Once I put you in a you're a piece of shit category, I don't care if your whole house and family burned down. That's just the way I am. Up until that, I'll be the greatest dude ever. Right. Like, you all fucking die for you. Right. But once you are a piece of shit that affects, you know, does damage to other people, you're fucking done. But isn't that a, that must be a necessity of fighting in a war, right? 100%. I mean, if you walk into every situation, second guessing, every single interaction you have while you're out in the field as a soldier, you know, talk about your risk spectrum. You're pushing yourself way down the risk spectrum every single time, right? Yeah, yeah, but, but you do see there's varying degrees of it. Like some people can still, can still do the job, but they still can have the awareness of kind of that human interaction. Like, oh, you know, this is another human being. Whereas when I, like this guy, um, he, it wasn't that he wasn't a human being. I just didn't give a shit. Like, I knew he was a piece of shit. I knew what he was doing. He was a horrible person. And I'm like, I'm glad you're dying. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. and, and it just didn't, but, but I didn't have, not only did I not have a sense of, oh, that's sad, but I also didn't have a sense of, all right, mm -hmm. one for the team. I, I, it was, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. I had absolutely no feeling towards it. And, and that was, uh, that was, it was kind of a, it, it was weird for me. And I just kind of realized that's why later, you know, these whole, so when I watch sociopaths, I'm like, okay, I definitely have that little quality to where I can just shut off any empathy whatsoever. If I, if I deem them as, as a, but you uh, have medical confirmation that you're not one. So you're good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, technically it's just an opinion. You yeah, know? yeah. 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 There you go. <laughs> you know, they, they could get an expert to, to counter it, but hey, is um, this, is this country gotten any better at helping veterans with PTSD or is it status quo? Uh, oh, that's a tough one. Um, it's definitely gotten better. Um, it's gotten better in the sense that the systems have gotten better. Uh, the problem that I see is, is again, so there's a guy uh, who I'll mention, um, which you should talk to, he's fucking cool as shit. Uh, this guy, Marcus Capone, started this, uh, fuck, what's it called? Okay, he's gonna kill me, but um, he's as big as Kevin. You know, it's, they're like the same size, but he started this thing where he basically, uh, it's all alternative medicine. And he takes guys through this whole, you know, ayahuasca, ibogaine, DMT. It, it's all legit, you know, all this stuff. And I mean, it has changed so many people's lives. And where I'm going with this is the system will always be the system. You know, for 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 people to think that the VA is 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 going to solve veteran trauma and veteran PTSD is is like saying that the DMV does a good job of freaking you know, monitoring drivers, right. you know? Right. No, it's right. it's going to come up to, or it's going to come down to us. Who has to figure it out? We do. Is it our responsibility? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. You can't say, at the same time, you can't say, you know, I believe in less government, but then also go, hey, the VA should fix me. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. You know, and, and again, I'm, I'm not talking politics, but I'm sure. saying... I'm not saying it should be up to us. What I'm saying is it is because we're the ones who have experienced it. We're the ones who know intrinsically what it is by, by our own feeling and experience. 
And it's just like the, I, t I told one of the VA psychologists this, I was like, you're telling me everything that you've read it to be, and I'm telling you what it is. But because you have the degree, you're right and I'm wrong. Right. Right. That makes no sense. Right. Like that, that li listen to me. Like I'm, I, I want help. I'm trying to help you help me, but you're fighting me on it. Um, and, and so I think it's up to us. And I, I think the system has gotten better, but ultimately uh, the ultimate way, like this, this thing that Marcus Capone is doing is it's, it's fringe, it's out there. 10 years, it won't be out there, it'll be normal. But, but those options at least exist now. They exist now, and, and they exist because some veteran tried them, or, or you know, and, and, and Marcus has really been spearheading it. But, um, you know, there's these, this brainwave treatment, there's all kinds of these things. But, and here's the worst part. All of them right now are uh, the brainwave thing, uh, Marcus's thing, Mar Marcus is a, a former dev group guy, it's, the amount of time it will take for those things to trickle down to a system like the VA, yeah. it's just, it's, it's the government. It's a, it's a bureaucracy, it's a behemoth. And um, that's why I say, I, I think it's up to us to take care of our own because um, it's just the system will never, by definition of what it is. I mean, I was a very lonely kid. I had fucking, imaginary friends, you know, uh, I was a very lonely kid and, and opening up my feelings got me hurt. So I just shut them off as a yeah. kid. And, um, that was my childhood and, and that was safe for me. So, um, that made the military really easy because right. I already shut off my feelings, you know, and I think a lot of guys, you know, maybe if they didn't shut them off when they were a kid, you know, once they start deploying, they shut them off. And, and then that, Again, PTSD is when they've been out long enough and the feelings get turned back on, and now there's a backlog of emotion um, that that just comes flooding in, and and it doesn't it doesn't I mean emotion by definition doesn't make sense. It's right. not logical. So right. it's like how do you how do you logically process something that's not logical? You don't. You just feel it. I guess one of the things too that I just like w also like knowing about you and then since the documentary because like you said like yeah, it's yeah. just so much has changed since yeah. and obviously you know and 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 so much your life has changed it's, it seems like your personality is like so geared towards you driving yourself but you also from like your work in the military um and now like what you're doing, you're such a team oriented person. Like you're so good at like inspiring people, helping people, building people up, understanding what people need to hear, what they don't need to hear. You know, the only way to like deal with like deep psychological uh, blocks or problems or PTSD, whatever the fuck you want to call it is like, you got to, you, you can't do that alone. Like you have to go to other people. So it's like those two things were kind of like playing against each other. Would you say that's right? A, a hundred percent. I, I, I only did the documentary because Rick was, you know, asked me and I said, yeah. And then I, I imagine you, you, you were hesitant. No, no, I really wasn't. Um, I, I wasn't because it was just me talking on camera about myself, which I'm doing right now. I, I don't give a shit. I'll tell right. you, I'll tell you about the fucking me as a kid at camp. I shit my fucking pants. I don't yeah. care. I did too, like, bro. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it happened. Yeah. Horrible day, yeah. but I don't care. You yeah, know, it yeah. doesn't, I don't judge myself on, yeah, on yeah. anything I've done or been and it's a camp um, diet man that's what you just judge the camp diet. <laughs> yeah 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 it was a bad one too <laughs> yeah. um but the you know so i didn't have a problem talking on camera it was when it became something and i first had to, i've only ever watched it once and rick fucking forced me to i drank an entire bottle of wine um and i don't really drink a lot of alcohol and watched it um and then when i had to like go and talk about it with audiences and get asked questions. That's when I got uncomfortable because I, I don't take compliments well. You said some very nice things. I disagree with most of them, but um, no, and I'm joking, but, but I don't take compliments well because that instinct to push myself, I only hear, I, won't, I only wanna hear what I'm doing wrong. It's the only way to help. You, you know what I mean? Saying, Tell me what I'm doing 100%. wrong. Yeah, I don't, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Tell me what I'm Does doing wrong. Does nothing for you. Yeah. And, um, and so it was very hard to, to hear 
people connecting with me because again, I shut off my feelings. So yep. a person connecting through my life was like really uncomfortable for me. And, and so it was a very strange realization of, oh, I did this because eh, it's talking in front of a camera, don't really care. And the, the, the other lesson I learned from the documentary was I need to put myself out there more. And, and I struggle with that every day. And mm -hmm. every day, I mean, on Instagram, I, I just actually started posting more in the last, I mean, I'll go months and not post something. And the last like week I've post like kind of a, a message, yeah. a, a life lesson or something. And every freaking time I do, every time I do, at least one person, if not more, will go, thanks for posting this, I needed this. Dude. Or and that what you posted about your dad, I was going to talk about, I was like, yo, dude, that, that fucking yeah. really, I, like, I was going to thank you for it. But I know that's also like, yeah, you don't really want to hear that. You know I, what I mean? It, but well, like, no, it's, at the, at, I'm trying to get yeah, better man. at it. Because... Well, you know, t t like what I was going to say about that too, man, is, 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 you know, what's so inspirational for me. And I mean, you've always been inspirational for me, period. But like, I, I just think that like this like acting shit like art you know like that saved my life you know, like i wasn't like in theater troops you yeah, know yeah, like yeah, i was yeah. like it was yeah. not me bro yeah and uh there's a risk and a danger to putting yourself out there and to like being honest like whether it's in front of a camera whether it's in front of a stage or whether it's just in front of people and it's like now man it's like you're a professional artist like that's like you're fucking the real deal dude like you're fucking acting you're directing it's like you you know and um you know, real life and, and our trauma and, and the shit that we've, like, that is ultimately, it's like, you know, it's like, that's, that's our currency, bro. Like, that's our, that's like turning that into positivity, touching other people, putting ourselves out. Like, that shit is like what it's about because like, ultimately, I, I just know this, but like, we're not trying to do this to like, you know, have a fancy car or anything. You know, it's like, we're, at, we're trying to connect with people. We're trying yeah. to like, put a put a label to some sort of emotion or feeling that someone else may have felt and and say like hey man i feel this too that's connectivity it's like why motherfuckers have been telling stories since they were cavemen you yeah. know what i mean yeah. and that's what we're after and like i'm wondering like now being an artist or being in it like doing this how has that made you grown how has it changed you like 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 what effect has it had so i really had to uh figure out you know what what it was that attracted me to, to film as a kid. I mean, I remember being like seven and walking around the track with my best friend at the time and we would f like Siskel and Ebert movies, you know, I mean, we would break them down, not just like, oh, that was cool, you know, like, oh no, that scene was really good because, because yep. you know, and, and again, uh, but what was it about film? And, and I've really thought about it in the last several years and I realized I shut off my feelings as a kid. The only time I had allowed myself to feel is when I was watching a movie. Wow. By myself. Wow. You know, like, okay, fine, fuck it. I cried during Notebook, all right? Yeah. <laughs> I was by myself, <laughs> I fuck watched yeah, it, bro. fuck you. I held everything fuck in yeah, and it nuked me, no. But um, yeah. but, but, but it, it, it was a safe place for me because it wasn't about my emotions. Sure. Like it, was, it was watching something on screen. So it, it, that's okay to be, you, you can let out those emotions because they're not yours. Right. And so now for me everything i think of is i i still have problems connecting in person but if i can put uh some art whether it's uh you know on camera or behind the camera or writing if it connects and 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 helps someone understand themselves then i'm i'm not connecting in person but i'm connecting through that art and mm. i i don't think there's anything at this point in my life i don't think there's anything more important in the world than art mm. um I, I i really don't um i i don't think i agree with you i don't think i would be alive if it wasn't for art um it's all i really aspire to do and and uh you know the flip side which obviously you'll know is you know we're, we're we work in a business that's a business mm -hmm. and you have to make somebody money to make art mm -hmm. Um, which, which is obviously difficult, but, um, I love the philosophical nature of, of, you know, who this character is and just all, all this stuff. Like you really ultimately film, actually, fuck it. All art is ultimately just about humans connecting in the human experience. All it is, yep. you know, whether it's sculpture, whatever it's, it's just, 
it's about being human and 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 really about being emotional and uh, uh, about our emotions and and I mean there is a logical component to storytelling, no question, but I just absolutely feel like, quite frankly, I feel like it's important. Um, and as a as a veteran, um, I I want to tell veteran stories that I feel um, what I know about what I've been through. You know, uh, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, despite what anyone tells you, and I actually, when I was at the, the agency, I actually said this inside there. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care what you guys say. Hollywood is the largest psyops campaign in the world. <laughs> and they were, they didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> and then think it was true, as true funny terms, as I right? did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, that's hilarious. You know, and they're like, <laughs> but, um, but I really, it, it is. And, and, and the ability for me to get out a message that I think can help people. I mean, yeah. that's what, that's the, at least the, 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 the hope, um, with, with this industry is, is putting out things that really help people or, or connect them or make them think about, uh, things they haven't thought of about themselves, et cetera. And I, um, and then I guess there's entertaining too. I'm so, I'm so curious though, because you talked a little bit about go about, you know, talking to your shrink and your, and just the disconnect between what your shrink had read in the book and your own lived experience and how that chasm could kind of never be bridged. So, so talk about that in terms of working in Hollywood, right? Where like you have this lived experience out in the real world where there may be one other person on the set, if anybody, who has that shared experience that you had, yet all these people are trying to recreate a reality that frankly, only you know. Does that make you this just like, do you have to just say eventually, like I gotta let it go because they can't get it exactly right? Or how do you process through that when you're working? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and and I'll, I'll say it this way, the, the, the difference um, so, you know, I, I've brought in several people in, into the industry, um, military people that, that I was like, Hey, you know, they were interested or I was just trying, Hey, you know, whatever. And, and I've had them be advisors and, and, and then that happens to where they can't adjust to the process of how film is made. Um, it, it, it no, 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 it has to be this way. Eh doesn't have to be anyway. Um, for me, anything I was advising was never about advising the military. It was creating the art. I, I love, uh, you know, working with, with good actors because no one will listen to you more intently than a really good actor. <laughs> just like, and they like, it's like a vacuum just taking it all in. It's pretty impressive. Um, but also it's, it's, just the 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 awareness of conversation you know it's like you tell them something and they go from here to here not experiencing it themselves and they go well i imagine if this then blah and you're like how the fuck did you put that talk about that psychopath shit, it, like, how did you put that together how, how did you make that jump you didn't experience it yourself i didn't i didn't tell you the in between and they just they get it and it's really um, the, the quality that the, you know, A-list actors like yourself have is this innate ability to just, A, curiosity, this curiosity, but just this innate understanding of, of, of humans and, and emotions. And, and it's just, it's really, and it's not taught. It's not taught. You either, it's something intrinsic in, inside you, like it, you have it or you don't. And, and obviously, it's, it's like it's like an Olympian, right? Michael Phelps, you know, is Michael Phelps because his body is Michael Phelps, and then he trained his ass off. You know, it's like there ain't no way I don't float. There's no way if I train <laughs> like Michael Phelps, I would be an Olympian. And you got to have both components. So he grew up with me, bro. So like any. Uh, everybody who I grew up with thinks acting's a fuck. They, they, you ain't got to get no compliments on that. He's like, <laughs> well, fuck I was going to say, you know, we have a 35-year track record of never complimenting each other. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I was yeah. about to utter a compliment. <laughs> oh, like, man. Yeah. Fuck, bro. I don't bro. know if I can squeeze it, or, but I'm going to try here. <laughs> uh, uh, and I was going to say, like, what you said about actors really listening, 
is also, I think, why you've gotten so much joy out of this podcast. Definitely. Is because having these conversations, like you are so equipped to live in the moment of a conversation like this and extract everything of value out of it. Um, and I think that's that's why this has been so enjoyable for you and, and why you put so much time into it. Lick my balls, I'm done. Bro. I'm never fucking <laughs> saying that again. Lick the undercarriage. That was horrible of my nuts, for me. Bro. I wish that had happened. <laughs> I, I, I just I'm just proud that Thank I could that I, somehow I was a catalyst for that moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I gotta shake that off. <laughs> but, uh, 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 I, I'm just wondering, just from uh, your your perspective, totally different. Um, you know, you know what. what one of the things we've done is like, you know, like I, I lived in, in Russia for a couple of years. It's like where I studied and shit. I still have a bunch of friends over there and friends in the Ukraine and stuff. I'm just wondering from your perspective, like what's your, do you have a take on that? Or like, how do you feel about it? Like the, the for what's going on over there? Yeah. Um, so it, it would, the best way to say it would be, you know, my take on it, going back to our earlier conversation, my take on it, three, four years ago would have been, well, 10 years ago, you know, would have been very different than, than it is now. Um, now I, I, it just makes me sad and it, and it makes me sad because, you know, it, it's very easy. It's very easy not having been in any of those shoes. It's very easy for someone to go, yeah, fuck the Russians, fucking Ukrainians, kill them all. And don't get me wrong. I understand that mentality and, and there's truth to it. The flip side is, you know, I guarantee most of those Russians on the ground don't want to be there mm -hmm. and, 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 and are, you know, essentially uh, conscripted and, and forced to be in that position and, 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 and they're getting slaughtered. You know, the, the Ukrainians are like, dude, you're invading my country, fuck you, get out. You know, it's like when I was in Iraq and I would tell the Iraqi, the bad guys through interpreters, I'd be like, look, dude, you want to fucking shoot me? You want to blow me up? Cool. I get it. I'm in your country. If you were in my country, I'd this. kill the fuck out of you. Yeah. Like, we're square. Sure. Like, I'm, I'm cool on that. Like, I, I have no issue with you trying to kill me. You blowing up your women and children to kill some of my guys, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I don't agree with that. But uh, going back to, to Ukraine, it's it's... Again, it's just it's it's the system, it's politics, and and again, it, it you just see it. It's just it's so obvious, and it it's just sad that you know it's 2022, and we're like, ah, it's so different than it was, you know, 1100. But are we really that different than kings, queens, pawns, serfs? Like, are we really that different, noblemen? Really? No. It's just humans. It's the way we're designed, and. It's, it's sadly, sadly we keep denying um, our fundamental nature. And I, I think that's what's hurting society right now is this fundamental denial of that we're actually fucking dark creatures. And the more you deny it, the more evil things you can do because you're lying to yourself that, mm -hmm. you're, that you don't have a dark side, mm -hmm. but you do. Um, and you know, that can be seen daily you know you can be seen when you get cut off in traffic you know F fuck you i got in my way first okay that's a micro analogy for let's say there's only so much food right like during the pandemic fuck you that's those are my toilet paper yeah you, you know what i mean it's it's we're designed that way and we don't need to judge it you know we just need to accept it and 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 you know um i i just i'm i'm sad that that it got to the point where it actually it actually happened and they actually invaded and uh and it, and they haven't pulled out yet i mean that's just it 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 worries me as a not as a country it worries me as a world that there hasn't been enough leverage to pull russia out of ukraine the world's getting weirder i, I mean we're approaching so many times that are unprecedented in the history of of mankind uh, like as an example okay uh ukraine russia did you know did he use conscripts and and you know push them yes so he still had to get people you know to 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 go um but we're not far away 
from a person being able to wage war without another human. Right. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, it's never happened before, and, and, and we're not far from it. In fact, I'd say it's, it's possible right now. It's, it's, I'm sure, laboratory possible. And I don't think people are aware how fast things are going to change. They're already changing fast, but it's an exponential curve. Um, and it's changing faster than people can accept and process. And it's only going to get faster. Uh, going back to therapy, too, it's, um, there's this therapy called uh, radical acceptance, I believe it is, where you're just like, no, no, no. And then at a certain point, you go, oh, my God. And then you just, like, accept everything at one time. <laughs> you know? I, I actually had that moment where I was just miserable. And, and this will segue to this is about a year ago. And I was just miserable. And I, I, I just wasn't happy. And everything was I just, I just it's just angry all the time, all these things. And I'm like, fuck, man, what, how did I get here? And again, the self-aware, like, how, how did I get here? And I thought about it, and I could only come up with one logical conclusion. And that was, what if everything I thought was wrong? Like, what if everything that I've denied is actually true? And what I denied for a long time is any form of spirituality. I'm not a religious person, but I just deny that. Again, I shut off my feelings, shut off that, you know. And I'm like, well, what if there's something to that, mm -hmm. you know? And I just, and it's just so crazy how, how you can fundamentally live your life for so long and then one day realize that, you know, you're, you're wrong about so much, you know? And, and the fact is, it's a fact that right now, everything we're talking about, it, it won't probably be wrong, but we'll know a lot more about it sure. in five years. And, and then we'll look back and go, oh my God, we were so naive then. Yeah. The smartest you are in your entire life is the day you die. Yeah. Yeah. How fucked up is that? Yeah. You know? Kind of a downer, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, I appreciate you guys letting me sit in on this, man. Dude, absolutely. It was yeah, a pleasure again, to meet you. Yeah, same, and 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 it was great to have you, and and it was even uh, that one moment was just the best. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad it happened. Glad I was here for that too. Yeah. Yo, can Thank I you. ask you a couple more questions? Is that cool? Dude, right. of course, man. All right, All right Gary. Hey, thanks, guys. Later, bro. Do you now, or at any point in your life, like have 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 you felt like you've had like a spiritual, spiritual connection, or? You know, I, when I put effort into it last year, when I had time, I'm, I'm not a religious person. And, um, I was at this place and they were talking about spirituality and they're like, you know, it doesn't, you know, it can be whatever, I forget what they called it, your spiritual, whatever. And I use the, the universe, you know, and the reason is, is I definitely didn't create it. I don't control it. <laughs> I know it exists. So, okay. The universe will be my, you know, my, my spirit, uh, animal for, for lack of a better term and it it definitely did something and and it was interesting because I couldn't tell you how or why but it I, I think what it did was it it subconsciously took a little bit of my need to control away mm -hmm. um and I I didn't realize how much that I I had a a, a problem with with control. control yeah but it, but it's also it's like a shift from it's a shift from controlling to to behaving i don't know i i, I look at the times in, in in my life that like trying to connect to something bigger i've always been really envious of people who who have like a pretty rich or, or, or like a, at least cogent spiritual life yeah i feel like it like helps them you know like I, in, in I, some I, ways. i'm the same way you've been in some in, in incredibly I don't want to use the word traumatic, but like you've been in fucking super, super fucking high pressure situations. Were you talking to anybody in those moments? Was there anybody like? I'm, I'm, I'm honestly so glad you asked that question because uh, it's, uh, again, I, I think an interesting story. So, um, and I don't know if I've ever told it. Um, so when I got blown up, uh, I had an arterial bleed. So um, from my uh, uh, ulna artery was bleeding. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it gives you about, I, I mean, it depends. And again, some doctors can be like, fuck you, you're wrong. You know, you have a couple minutes. Did you it. know that? Um, not at first. At first I thought my arm was blown off. I, I, cause I could feel it gone. I know that sounds weird, but 
it felt not there. Um, and because it, it blew my nods off, so I couldn't see, everything was dark in the house, there was a gunfight going on, I couldn't hear anything, you know. Um, but when I eventually got outside of the house, there was a, a, like a fucking porch light on, and that was the first time I looked at it, and it was fucking hamburger meat. Um, and then it was, it was, it was what it was hang, hamburger meat. I mean, it was just, it was broken in so many places that it, it wasn't just like twisted. It was like, it was, I don't know how they saved it, but it was mangled. It, it, it literally looked fake. Um, it, but I noticed that I was bleeding uh, pretty profusely. Um, and then there was a, a wall, like, you know, and I just looked at it and I'm like, well, that ain't fucking happening. You know, like, I'm not getting over that. Um, and I think I maybe at that point lost consciousness for a minute or two. I remember just plopping against the wall. But anyways, I, um, well, at first I remember thinking, okay, my arm is definitely gone. It's fucking gone. Like, fucking goodbye. Have a good one. Um, I'm going to be an armless vet. And I just, I just remember this like whole process in my head of thinking, God, I'm a one armed and just like flashes of Vietnam veterans, you know, were in my head. And, and then I'm like, all right. And I kind of accepted that. And then, then I remember going, Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You might die. And I was like, Oh fuck. Yeah. You know, like I, and this is within, you know, a couple seconds. Sure. But I was like, Holy shit. You might die from this. Like, you got to fix this. And I'm like, yeah, you don't want to die from this. Is it? That'd be fucking stupid. And then when um, uh, one guy got to me, uh, which, and this is just fucking cosmic stardust, the guy that comes and puts the tourniquet on my arm is the guy who I was with on that mission in Afghanistan when I was a ranger. What are the odds of that? So... I'm there, and I'm and I'm laying there, and I'm I'm. Wait, which 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 guy from from from? So remember when I said I worked with the unit I wanted to go to, and they were selecting their own targets and doing stuff in Afghanistan. Yeah. When I was a ranger. Yeah. That guy, cut to I'm in his unit now. Wow. And he's the one who put the tourniquet on my arm. Wow. The guy you're like I want to do that. Yeah. What are the odds? You know, years later. Um, and so I. Uh, but I'm I'm there and I'm and I and it just kind of occurs to me that I, you know fuck I I might die and and people were working on on me but you know you, you don't know it's hard to gauge you know uh, you know it's bad but like again you don't and 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 are the guys that I mean you were shot at oh there's a gunfight going on in the house right still. so I mean yeah. has that been dealt with yet or uh, I no i think it was still going they on. they were still there. fighting yeah it was a lot of it was a lot of guys um but um so anyways uh i'm laying there and i'm like oh fuck i i, I might die and then it just kind of hits me i'm like shit i i might actually die oh my god like this is when religion comes and, and i'm like i'm in this you know pain i'm in this fucked up situation and i'm like kind of excited like again human exper uh, experiment i'm like all right like Come on, religion! Like, you where know, are you God? where are you at? Where are you yeah. at? Yeah, and I'm like laying there, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, all right, you know, how do I feel? And I just started like kind of going through the process, and and I'm like, nope, still, still nothing. Like I and I legitimately thought I could die, and I just was like, I just, I don't have it. It just wasn't, it wasn't there, and and it's because I wasn't open to it. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fool. It was, it was. I was expecting something to like hit me over the head sure. and you know, and again, it's the people that are open to that concept and all those things, it comes to them. The people that, it's just like I go to a, I don't believe in ghosts and I go to a freaking ghost house and I sleep there and mm, oh, shockingly, I slept through the night and had no fucking problems, right. weird, right? right? right, right. You know, oh, they must have not come out that night. No, right. it's that I don't fucking care, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so it, it's one of those things where it kind of disappointed me, to be huh. perfectly honest. It, it kind of, and again, it was my lack of, you know, but I, I was I was hoping that I was going to have some kind of, like, sense of some kind of next step, and I just didn't. I just felt like I was just going to die right there in the fucking mud and a sh fucking shithole in Sodder City shanty town. Like, I, I just... I didn't have a good feeling about it. I, I had like 
how fucking stupid would it be if I fucking died right here in the in the mud laying down? It just like kind of disgusted me. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? It, did, it didn't feel honorable to you, you know what I mean? It didn't wow. feel like I thought it should feel. It's like going out on the battlefield, you know, like Lieutenant Dan, you know, like yeah. it just felt like if you experience anything like that now, do you feel like it would be different? I don't know if that's an answerable question. But. I, you know, I would hope. I, I would hope. Um, I definitely have a different spiritual belief. Um, now, I the simple way to explain my spirituality is I don't know what it is, but there's something bigger than me. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's a fact that I don't fucking know. Yeah. But it's proof that there's got to be because I didn't fucking create myself. So right. that's kind of where I'm at. So I would hope it would be different. And and um, But, yeah, I've always been jealous of people that are on that spiritual wavelength right. to where it's just a real connection. But right now you have so much to say. Like, right now you have so much to do. Like, you have so much work. Like, you have so much shit that you want to yeah. do and accomplish. And it yeah. just seems like, you know, when I... I don't know, man. It, it just seems to me so much of like your psychology back then was like fucking tur- tur- turning shit off. Yeah, it was right? about shutting everything off. And now it's about trying to open up. And, and you know, the other thing, I mean, I was just a sad kid, you know. I was, I was a kid where they would, uh, you know, go like, hey, we're going to go toilet paper Mr. John- old Mr. Johnson's house. And, you know, I was like fucking seven, eight, nine. And I'd be like, Why? I don't want to do that. He'll have to pick it up. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking? You know, I'm like, that would be sad watching old man John. And it just like, uh, and they're like, what the fucking fucking moron? You know, you know, it just, discomfort is growth. And I wanted that discomfort. Is that bucket, is that a bucket that you feel like is filled with? Like, have you filled that bucket? Or is that, is that, does that go forward? It's a struggle, you know? It's a struggle. I hear you, bro. It's a struggle. That's a daily struggle. And and because, again, I, I can see where, you know, there, there's a lot to um, self-care and all these different things, but there hasn't been a time that I haven't done something extremely self-destructive that I didn't learn something from mm-hmm. and, and, and that I didn't really gain from the experience. And, and you know, you're kind of, it's like balancing. It's like, is it worth it, you know? And, um, and I just have this fundamental need sometimes. And, and again, going back to what I said way earlier, which is about acceptance of self like I have finally had to accept that at a certain level I crave self-destruction I just do and I accept it um and I had to accept it because if I pretended it wasn't there it would it it would happen you know without me really being you know I would just go into that mode so I just like look man again you you know I'm 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 super interested in that and I think that's also not being not sound like a fucking douchebag but it's kind of like the artist's journey too it's like I I I believe something you know we talked about him earlier it's something shy and I kind of argue about all the time like this this need to like bleed out I don't know if that's the same, but can you give me an example of like the last time or something recently you felt like you've de- done that was self-destructive? Um, usually my self-destructive behavior was with, was with women, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, I partied in Vegas with strippers for like two years straight. It was fucking literally all I did, you know? Um, and, and that's a crazy lifestyle. And, and it was a destructive lifestyle. And, it, and again, it was how much can I destroy myself and still bring myself back? What level of destruction can I go to mm-hmm. and still come back from? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I haven't found it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know what it is. It's fucking death, obviously. <laughs> um, but how close could I get to that? It's a perverted sense of of, of self challenge. Challenge, yeah, and yeah. This, this, that cycle. But is there a way you can channel that into work? And and that's what I've been doing. And that's what I've been doing. I've I've been much better. Like the last, I, I finally realized that that about a year ago that that self destruction and, and that I was attracted to that destruction. Like that girl's fucking crazy. Well, let me give her a call. Let me take her out. You know, like, Hey, those friends, you shouldn't hang out with them. Fucking come on guys. You know, like that was just what I was 100% uh, the way it was. And, um, 
and, and, and you know, a, a, like a good example would be, a, a, not that I know specifics at all, but commonly mentioned about you know, Heath Ledger and, and his process for the Joker and all, all these things. It's, it's very, it's a, to me, it's a similar mentality of, of self-destruction. And, and the problem is society or people that don't have that it doesn't make sense. So right. when you're, you know, that way uh, in your normal life and, and you see self-destructive behavior, people are like, you know, in the military, and the reason I bring up the military is, is because it's being, you know, they're, they're just wrecking dudes for getting DUIs, getting, you know, dude, what the fuck were you doing speeding 120 miles an hour? Well, because they were trying to get some adrenaline. Yeah. Once you've been at this level of adrenaline and you yeah. go home, like, once you've been shot at in close proximity, yeah. well, well, you know, how are you going to replicate that? Hop, you know, buy a new motorcycle and go 130 miles an hour. You know, right. it's like, okay, uh, man, man, maybe I'll get the cops to chase me. Fuck it. I don't care because I'm trying to feel, I'm, you're chasing the dragon of destruction no different than chasing the dragon on a drug. Yeah. Because despite what most people say, adrenaline is an addictive fucking, fucking drug. Absolutely. And once you've got it, you're always looking for it again. You know, I did, I did see that post that you put up on your pop oh, yeah, and then, yeah. like, tying it into, you, you, you know, that, that little part of the documentary and stuff. It's like, what, can you just, like, where are you guys at? And, like, what, what is your relationship with your dad, if you don't mind me asking? So, my dad, uh, my dad had, uh, is an alcoholic, has always been been an alcoholic I, I knew he was an alcoholic when i was you know fucking five six years old yeah. um you know two or three years ago i had to bail my dad out of jail on new year's eve for a dui he's fucking 72 years old you know um but i hated him i hated him because he was a shitty dad i mean you know um i just wanted someone to take me hunting and shooting and you know, he just drank and passed out. And, and again, you know, it's not like he fucking beat me up. It, you know, it's, it's many kids had many worse childhoods. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I just, I didn't really, uh, I hated him, you know. Um, and then when I was forced to, to, you know, he, because of his drinking, my mom divorced him. He, you know, didn't have a place. He got into a car accident, drinking and driving, lost his vehicle, didn't have a place to live. So I, I let him move into my house. And, um, and you know, I, it was scary how many things I saw uh, in him that, that are qualities in me. Mm. And, and I hate those qualities about him. And so then when I realized that I do him, fuck, it was like a slap in the face mm. because I realized like, like why I do those things, you know, you know what I mean? Like, um, one would just be, you know, like immediately being defensive. If you say something, I'm, Oh, I know, you know, like, like immediately trying to, to say something's not my fault. Like he, he, you know, he always does that. And it's like, and it could just be your, it's not about whose fault it is. You're just trying to express your feelings about something or, or whatever, but it made me understand him. Um, and it, made me realize that my struggles were also his struggles mm -hmm. and that I just I've got to get over the past and I shouldn't I shouldn't judge him on on anything and um and and now too I you know I went through a period where I wanted a dad I want I, I wanted him to stop drinking and and uh and then I just finally realized like he'll never stop drinking like he's how it hasn't killed him to be perfectly honest, he should be fucking studied by science because I, I don't know how he's yeah, not yeah, dead. Yeah. But but um, but I finally just had to accept him for who he is. He's an alcoholic. He'll always be an alcoholic. Alcohol will kill him. And I just have to accept that. And that doesn't change the fact that he's my dad. And I'll always love him yep. for that. Yep. Um, I, I accept him as, as who he is. I accept his dark side, um, and in that was in that process was, again, me learning to accept my own. You know, my self destruction comes from him. Yeah, and I have absolutely no doubt. My my dad would have been happy 
and again, this is so fucked up, but I, it's true. My dad, my dad's life would have been complete had he gone to Vietnam and died. That's what he wishes his life was. Wow. Um, when he was at my house, he'd watch fucking Vietnam documentaries literally all day long, uh, interviews just nonstop. He had a hernia, which is why he didn't go to Vietnam. And he just, again, it's like he wants to, he wanted to go and either come back fucked up or come back or not come back. And it's, and I'm like listening to this stuff. I'm like, that's, he didn't even go to Vietnam. Why the fuck is he? And I slowly put it together. It's like, there's just something, there's just something in him. It's the same thing in me. And we don't choose it, but to deny it's there is to deny who we are. Fucking A, dude. You know? and, and, and knowing it is like every, you know, especially as an artist, man. Like yeah. knowing that it's everything, like, you, you know, everything. And that reckless abandon that you're talking about, though, that's that's positive destruction. Oh, dude. You know? Dude. Uh, yes, man. Positive. Super positive. And I think I, I would even go as far as say, like, the darker you can go, the deeper into the wound, like I was saying, that you could go into yourself. And, yeah. like, to do that, you, even if it costs part of you, it, it's actually... I mean, it's such a fucking lame word, but it's super fucking therapeutic. Too. <laughs> I knew it's like, you know what I mean? It's yeah, such yeah, a yeah. bitch word, but it's like, yeah. you actually are like, yo. And then you're like, I left that. I did that actually. F like, I pulled out something from me that, that, that has only led to like destruction, violence, mayhem, betrayal, awfulness, vileness. And I like pulled it out of me in like a fucking actually safe way where I wasn't actually hurting yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah. And like this will somebody will see it and be like, yo, man, I I know that. Like I yeah. fucking fuck, I see that. I'm I'm really, really fucking excited to see, you know, like what this this next chapter of your life is is, is gonna be, man. It's, yeah, it's yeah, like, it's I I mean, going to what you just said, it's it's really what I figured out is just and I should have mentioned this earlier, but the the need for destruction is not going to change it's no it's about just choosing positive destruction yeah and uh and, and actually i could also replace the word uh, uh destruction with chaos, chaos I crave, i've craved chaos B yeah because, me too. because i'm comfortable in chaos yeah. and there's few things more fucking chaotic than than a film set and yeah, yeah. being you know being on camera is fucking chaotic yeah. like yeah um yeah. directing chaotic yeah. and and i love that chaos i crave it i'm comfortable in it and it's healthy chaos the fact that you're going to be able to like marry all this and like that you're it's fucking great hey what's going on everybody it's john bam bam the dog uh first on behalf of both of us and everybody from the real ones team i just want to sincerely thank you guys for, for for tuning in the folks that i bring on the show they're family to me, and uh, being able to tell their stories and bringing you into their world is something that I'm, I'm just super proud of and, uh, again, grateful that you guys tune in. We've decided we want to take things just a step further. It's a Patreon community, and basically what that means is if you become a part of this community, look, I already bored Bam Bam. If you want to become a part of this community, you're going to be able to hear episodes early and all that, ad-free and all that good stuff, but there's all this behind-the-scenes footage, all this stuff that we've shot um, that really brings you into the folks that we've had on the show, really brings you into their world. Live chats with me and the folks that I bring on the show to talk about their world, talk about the issues that they're dealing with, about their triumphs and their tragedies. Just go to Patreon slash Real Ones on this website that you see right there, right on the screen, that's right in front of you. This whole idea was um, something about building bridges and, 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 and bringing people together and um, bringing folks that often don't get the mic and, and giving the mic to them. So the fact that you guys tune in means the world. Anyways, again, thank you. Uh, be good to each other out there. Rock and roll. I'm gonna get a workout in a little bit with my man Eric Linden, stunt coordinator from The Punisher. He's coming all the way up because we are about to get after it. And when that's done, he asked me in the car, are you gonna have my shake ready? And I know what that means. Am I gonna have my Sun Warrior shake? They've got the active protein, but they also have this collagen protein, which is amazing. They also have uh, the Warrior blend, which is a little bit lighter if you're trying to cut. And uh, I believe in it. I believe in that Sun Warrior stuff. Go to www.sunwarrior.com dot com slash real ones.